had it set earlier. Oh, we had a 5 4 person. Yeah. Fuck that up. That's all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's no easy. worries. How's this cool. film? Yeah, good. Cool. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Intro, the beginning. Mother's hands are warm in my sleep. My eyes see only memories of me. My breathing changes involuntarily. When I wake up, I see her struggling. And tightness collapses my throat. It is then that I know the truth. My mother is trying to kill me. And from this moment on, my life becomes a paradox. She loves me and she wants me to die. I am lonely and her schizophrenia never leaves me alone. So I live my life as honestly as I can and I become a great pretender. How else am I supposed to live when low-grade trauma won't get out of my DNA. Mm -hmm. So I smile, and I cry, and I'm fine. I think maybe it's supposed to be this way. I have lost my childhood, and my childhood has rooted itself in my body. Its trauma never lets me go. This is a story of grief in six stages. Stage one, denial. Coachella, alive and numb. What I wouldn't give to be one of those girls with a flower wreath in her hair. I want that halo of youth, crown of delicate daisies bleeding into my sweat, my eyes, my mouth. I want no responsibility. He drops the pill into your hand. You can't feel a thing at first, and then you grab me beg me to pull you to safety because the grass grows soggy beneath you and you are sinking. But it's a desert, I say. I feel nothing. Hair clings to your forehead and neck. It's a dirty, sweaty thing this day and this place. And so we drop together because we are safe. Landlocked, belonging to nobody forever. Junior boys bounce the house. Their electronic madness blows up under the tent. The sun dies behind the desert backdrop. Dropped beats shake the stage. I jump, jump, jump. The bass synthesizes in my chest. And quakes chase the shiver into my blood. I look around the wavy sea of bodies and tongues on mouths and hands. They are us, we are them. All parts of holes, parts of the whole. Then, ecstasy drops us like tumbleweeds of fur and light. Haptic hedonism lifts from my skin like flames. I am invisible fire. And I've never felt so alive and so numb at the same time. Later, someone is driving the SUV. We don't care who or if they're high, because we are too, and it tastes better than the ghost of music pulsing in our veins. The cops roll by, we drop down low. <laughs> that half death, see hum sound pounding the light out of us slowly beneath the open sunroof in the glow of the waning moon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, making a mess. Mm. I don't know if it's a poem, you know? Thinking about drugs? <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> We're still in denial. Photo cage, the filter. Don't be afraid, you with your marshmallow eyes and strawberry heart. There is horizon out there and water refracting all around us, deepening forever. I know you think I'm demanding like sunshine, and I will melt you if you stay too long. Please don't run, hold my hand. And we will stroll together through the blend of days, and the future will lower like a bridge so we can cross it and hope to die. Your skin's caramel and milk call me to you. 
Don't be afraid of moments captured. Or if I fall drunk into a rapture of passion, don't be afraid of my poet mouth with its hunger for memories. I'll only snap a thousand photographs, no less, no more. And we will smile in every one, squint a little to make our eyes extra glossy, and the end will come with the night. For now, we are safe, even as we look at the sun. I will apply a filter, anyone you choose, and no one will ever discover who we really are. Stage two, disorganization. <laughs> Bird brain all over the place. <laughs> the irony is not lost on me that I drive to a quiet street to take a walk. The place is shaded by trees that bow toward each other overhead. The country houses are nestled back from the road a bit next to a private creek. My phone rings. It's my brother. He tells me he has lost his tact during the pandemic, that he finds himself saying all the wrong things, like how at a dinner party, he told a room full of strangers that Jewish people should have gotten over the Holocaust by now. But it wasn't what he meant. He was trying to say he hopes we've come a long way since then and that we will all learn from the past and be better because of it. I understand him completely. I too have lost my ability to speak intelligently. Mostly, I find myself cracking dad jokes in the supermarket checkout line. <laughs> but often the result is the same. Something comes out of my mouth and I instantly want to put it back. My brother and I laugh about our social faux pas, just as a family of quail pop out of the bushes in front of me. One by one, they scurry uncertainly across the asphalt, their feathery question marks curling from their heads. Wrong way, nope, yes, turn back. They make a U-turn and stop, U-turn and stop, only to continue again in their initial direction. I can almost hear their indecisiveness. Wait, go, stop and turn back, no, stop. Again, turn back, no, that way, okay, this way. Their necks lurch forward as they follow each other into the thicket. <sighs> to be decisive and be okay with it. To be contained in a slight body of feathers. To waver and go, waver and go, and have no anxiety about it. No regret, guilt, or shame. <sighs> I wish. I don't want to walk today. I want to go back the way I came. So I drive home. Stage three, anger. A question like this, I have to say it. How is one to say, I want you to love me? A question like this shows too many insecurities, such as, I want you to hurt when I hurt. I want you to know my wounds and lick them clean. And I need you. But a woman's heart must be made of stone and marsh of hot flesh and hollow parts. So she may be empty enough to absorb everyone's grief and coolly deny her own. Solid enough to unburden others by lifting their sorrows. Bold enough to bear the spade, carve out the shapes of her dreams only to bury them again and again. To make room for more stories that don't even belong to her. A woman is taught to put others first. So how is one to say, I want you to howl so I do not have to. I want you to devour me so I will not hunger. How is one to say, I need you to see me. I am not invisible. And when the thought of her own slit throat pains her less than her silence, she will decide the ultimatum. She will either say, if you intend to live, I need you to ache for me. Or she will say, if you intend to die, I hope you bleed so you will forever feel me in your scars. Stage four, 
guilt and bargaining. Transference, my childhood is showing. A decade together and still I fear you will leave me. I apologize at the startle of something small, of your sneeze that blows through my nerves like a hurricane. My first father left when I was one. I wore no shoes on my feet and still I think I should have chased him. His absence was like fire burning his path forward and leaving singed things behind. This is why I sift through ashes and why your doubting my decisions sends me back in time to all the moments I could have altered if only I'd apologized. I am full of apologies now. I'm sorry for innumerable mistakes, for being late, for being too slow, for taking time to choose my words. I am sorry for responding to your light touch as if you've branded me with a hot poker. I think I still expect to be alone in this life. So when you show up, my body needs time to adjust to your presence. I'm sorry for demanding that you make more noise every time you pad softly into the room. Logically, I know you are not my murderer, but I have trusted before and it hasn't gone well. Be gentler, sorry. Do I contradict myself? Sorry. Do my emotional outbursts make you uncomfortable? Sorry. Should I gather my vulnerabilities, secure them in bubble wrap, pack them away in a storage facility to preserve your fragility? My body is hypervigilant, sensitive, still in shock. It anticipates learned nightmares from very long ago. The truth, I haven't been, to, been abandoned in a very long time. Another, what is a very long time? Logically, I know my responses are not your fault, but can you please sneeze more softly? <laughs> I hear myself asking you to be loud sometimes and quiet others, and I hear how it is my need for control, because if you can help me, I don't need to become stone. If you change, I won't have to. Yes. I have been my own watchdog for a very long time. You're young and healthy, and still I worry you will be taken from me too soon. Help me be brave so that when you are gone, I will not feel your absence like an excavation. I don't want to resent you for how you tread upon the earth. Don't want to resent your silence and hate your noise. I already resent my body for treating my childhood like a wound that never heals. I already resent those I trusted for forcing me open and making me believe their failures were mine. Damn, <laughs> we're only at stage five. I feel like we should be farther along by now. But isn't that how it always goes with trauma? <laughs> Depression. Sweet TikTok, if wishes were real. I wish I were the sweet TikTok, stepping, 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 from one number to the next on a red hand. Instead, I am the number waiting, waiting, waiting for each tick to talk, a numb black vibrated into stillness, a silent scream calling, calling, calling out my wish into wall and glass, muted voice, empty throat, straining, forcing, resigning, tongueless in the body of a clock. We're still in stage five, depression. Yes. Fatigue, the body remembers. It feels like a pulling of muscles down from the inside, stretching, every sinew snapping back, 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 reverberating as small specks, X of pain. It feels like cement blocks, anvils inside vessels and veins carrying blood. Blood, blood, and I just can't go on. 
Breathing is shallow, low, low. Legs go slow, oh, like all day under C. E, E, woozy, dizzy, like insects swarming, crawling, revolting, ear to ear to ear, ear, ear. Gut is bloated, a bowling, ba, ba, ball. Heart palpitates, surprise attack, Vision, blurry, world, weary, wavy, gray. This is what dying feels like, k k said the dead girl. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> All right. Stage six, loss. Old as you, coping is a choice. I see you in my mirror, the pores in my skin and the high bones in my cheeks. We are wine glass, lipstick, smooth, cool, map of freckles. And how when I lay my cheek against your legs, I smell a campfire. The fire burning down the tip of your cigarette, hanging from your lips. You heaved the television out the window. I didn't see you do it, but the television landed on the grass and it had to be you. You came outside, quivering, lips, mouthed, something. Cigarette fell, held your hands out, palms up to catch a falling sky. I stopped fearing you might kill us with your bare hands as we slept. You, 41, me, 10, 41, the age I am now, and you are dead. And I never smelled that smoke again in your hair, on your fingers, your face. My guilt, my absence, my need for redemption no longer catches in my throat like a splintered, fragile bone. But I feel it there, wearing smooth as stone, worn smaller, and shiny with trying. Oh. We're still de dealing with loss. Scars I carry, my body betrays me. Pink and notched, a sign of woundedness and healing. My body's scars tell my stories. I met someone once who asked me if I'd been shot. He was referring to the five round mottled keloids that mark my stomach. I was embarrassed to admit the truth that I'd had moles removed. I wish I'd told him someone tried to take me out in a dark alley and like a superhero, I bounced bullets off my chest. Injuries on the inside are easier to hide. This is where I carry the scars of my mother's schizophrenia. It's in my DNA. Her disease always ruins families and sometimes skips generations. Mostly because of her, I didn't want children. Considered it irresponsible and selfish to tempt unpredictable genetic outcomes. The line over my pelvic region is a purpled horizon separating my stomach from my bikini area a six inch line over where my uterus was extracted. It reminds me that I couldn't have children. Endometriosis had made a garden of scars in my uterine cavity. I hadn't planned to have children, but I don't care who you are, there was something unsettling about raw, blatant truths. They're like a slamming door closed forever on your hopeful heart. All that's left now is a nub of a cervix, a coarse, crooked, half numb reminder of the emptiness that has replaced the searing agony of my monthly cycle. All that's left now is a woman who was forced into early menopause. Far worse violations have been committed against women's bodies. Mine is one of the lucky ones. My scars are portals to my youth. They are wisdom sewn into my skin. Signs that survival can cancel out fear I can be cut away little by little and still 
remain whole. Deeper than skin, my scars convince me I'm more than my body, more than what my form gives or lacks. I'm a life, a lesson, a soul, essence grafted from hope, love, and bone. Any life worth living will see suffering. And it is only in the mending that we begin to learn gratitude. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. My scars remind me how lucky I've been. We're still dealing with loss. Life, not logic. I want to connect. Tell me a story about how you were gutted, about how you cried. I don't want clean, clear-cut perfection, a prescriptive life of measured moments. I want messy, broken, cracked, and seeking how to cope with mistakes that have held you back. I want a life, not a logic. I want to know the lesson you've become. I want to know about your forgiveness because I crave a certain softness. And when you caress the night with your words, show me you understand it is the sorrow that makes us strong and the upheaval that makes us beautiful. This is kind of interesting. I kind of got lost in where we are in the stages, even though I wrote it down. (laughs) Such a great metaphor, right? We're still lost. So you. you. Stage seven, acceptance. Too lost. How to self-soothe. She was too lost to be found, so she fed her compass to the lung raw wolves who emptied their howls into the trees. They ate her voice so she wouldn't question the universe. They drank her blood so her river veins wouldn't drip from her wounds. Hollowed and weightless, she ascended into the sky, became so much star she started to shine. Then moon mouthed a curse and swallowed her glow so she wouldn't pulse. She drifted like dust and raged with light. Between her hands, she molded an onyx planet that cooled her tongue and calmed her breath. She was too lost to be found. So she fed and she fed and she fed. This next one needs a brief background. My second mother was my teacher. She didn't plan to keep me. It was only supposed to be temporary. Her husband, a stranger to me, gave her courage. She worried about me so much, talked about me every day. Finally, he told her to shut up about me or bring me home. She wasn't one to ignore a blunt ultimatum. So she brought me home. Nature, these things happen. The winged thing hit the window, hard and soft at the same time, a dull thump that made me jump. I'd been sitting there on the couch, reading, minding my business. But tragedy is never convenient. I crept outside. Nothing obvious caught my eye. But then, iridescence twitched like a premature heart in the dirt among the ice plant. I called to my dad for help. I'd never asked a man for anything in my life, other than once when I was nine and met my biological father for the first time. I begged him to stay, grabbed a hold of his leg, and he dragged me to the door, shook me loose, and walked away. But this new man, my new dad, He scooped up the hummingbird, 
wrapped his hands around the blue-black plumes. Make it fly, I begged. It was a different wish, asking a favor for a bird instead of one for myself. Look away, he said, and we both knew what had to be done. In the silent afternoon, the twitter and squeak of injury was but a moment of restlessness. And my dad, he had no choice, so he snapped the poor bird's silken neck. I never blamed him. But sometimes, when the world is very still, I can hear that thump of heartbreak in my chest, and it reminds me that every life must fade. And while some men leave, the best ones do the right thing, and they stay. Conclusion, this is not the end. So yes, I live my life as honestly as I can. I smile and I cry and I'm fine. When I was a child, to reach me, you had to trudge for miles in the dark, the moon your only guide. I couldn't give you a compass. I didn't know where I was either, only that I was lost. So how could I begin to instruct you on how to find me? Maybe it was supposed to be that way, quiet, lonely, a forest in which I was the only tree that nobody could hear devastate the hard earth when it fell. I used to think I was supposed to be unseen, unknown, so I could grow strong out here alone. Then I thought maybe I was the forest and you couldn't see me for the trees. But now, I think I couldn't be alone if I tried. I'm a microcosm of experience, absorbent and alive. I am made of roots and bark and branches that extend upward. I am surrounded by love and light, and this is why I survive. I've almost died eight times, and I consider myself lucky. If I'm on my ninth life, it may be my last. So you'd better believe I'm going to make it count. Yeah. Thank you.